Chapter Ten of Hard Times by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hard Times by Charles Dickens, Chapter Ten, Stephen Blackpool. I entertain a weak idea that the English people are as hard-worked as any people upon whom the sun shines. I acknowledge to this ridiculous idiosyncrasy as a reason why I would give them a little more play. In the hardest working part of Coketown, in the innermost fortifications of that ugly citadel, where nature was as strongly bricked out as killing airs and gases were bricked in, at the heart of the labyrinth of narrow courts upon courts and close streets upon streets which had come into existence piecemeal every piece in a violent hurry for some one man's purpose and the whole an unnatural family shouldering and trampling and pressing one another to death in the last close nook of this great exhausted receiver where the chimneys for want of air to make a draught were built in an immense variety of stunted and crooked shapes as though every house put out a sign of the kind of people who might be expected to be born in it among the multitude of coketown generally called the hands a race who would have found more favour with some people if providence had seen fit to make them only hands or like the lower creatures of the seashore only hands and stomachs lived a certain stephen blackpool forty years of age stephen looked older but he had had a hard life it is said that every life has its roses and thorns there seemed however to have been a misadventure or mistake in stephen's case whereby somebody else had become possessed of his roses and he had become possessed of the same somebody else's thorns in addition to his own he had known to use his words a peck of trouble he was usually called old stephen in a kind of rough homage to the fact a rather stooping man with a knitted brow a pondering expression of face and a hard-looking head sufficiently capacious on which his iron-gray hair lay long and thin old stephen might have passed for a particularly intelligent man in his condition yet he was not he took no place among those remarkable hands who piercing together their broken intervals of leisure through many years had mastered difficult sciences and acquired a knowledge of most unlikely things he held no station among the hands who could make speeches and carry on debates thousands of his compeers could talk much better than he at any time he was a good power loom weaver and a man of perfect integrity what more he was or what else he had in him if anything let him show for himself the lights in the great factories which looked when they were illuminated like fairy palaces or the travellers by express train said so were all extinguished and the bells had rung for knocking off for the night and ceased again and the hands men and women boy and girl were clattering home old stephen was standing in the street with the old sensation upon him which the stoppage of the machinery always produced the sensation of its having worked and stopped in his own head yet i don't see rachel still said he it was a wet night and many groups of young women passed him with their shawls drawn over their bare heads and held close under their chins to keep the rain out he knew rachel well for a glance at any one of these groups was sufficient to show him that she was not there at last there were no more to come and then he turned away saying in a tone of disappointment why then i missed her but he had not gone the length of three streets when he saw another of the shawled figures in advance of him at which he looked so keenly that perhaps its mere shadow indistinctly reflected on the wet pavement if he could have seen it without the figure itself moving along from lamp to lamp brightening and fading as it went would have been enough to tell him who was there 
making his pace at once much quicker and much softer, he darted on until he was very near this figure, then fell into his former walk, and called, Rachel! She turned, being then in the brightness of a lamp, and, raising her hood a little, showed a quiet oval face, dark and rather delicate, irradiated by a pair of very gentle eyes, and further set off by the perfect order of her shining black hair. It was not a face in its first bloom. She was a woman five and thirty years of age. Ah, lad, tis thou. When she had said this, with a smile which would have been quite expressed, though nothing of her had been seen but her pleasant eyes, she replaced her hood again, and they went on together. I thought there was to hang me, Rachel. No. Early to night, lass. Times I'm a little early, Stephen. Times a little late. I'm never to be counted on going home. No go it t'other way, neither, seems to me, Rachel. No, Stephen. He looked at her with some disappointment in his face, but with a respectful and patient conviction that she must be right in whatever she did. The expression was not lost upon her. She laid her hand lightly on his arm a moment, as if to thank him for it. We are such true friends, lad, and such old friends, and getting to be such old folk now. Nay, Rachel, thou art as young as ever thou was. One of us would be puzzled how to get old, Stephen, without t'other getting so too, both being alive. But anyways, we're such old friends, and to hide a word of honest truth from one another would be a sin and a pity. "'Tis better not to walk too much together. "'Times, yes. "'Twould be hard indeed if t'was not to be at all,' she said, with a cheerfulness she sought to communicate to him. "'Tis hard always, Rachel.' "'Try to think not, and t'will seem better.' "'I've tried a long time, and t'ain't got better. "'But thou are right. "'Might make folk talk, even of thee. "'Thou hast been that to me, Rachel, through so many year. Thou hast done me so much good, and heartened of me in that cheering way that thy word is law to me. Ah, lass, and a bright good law, better than some real ones. Never fret about them, Stephen, she answered quickly, and not without an anxious glance at his face. Let the laws be. Yes, he said, with a slow nod or two. Let em be, let everything be, let all sort alone. Tis a muddle, and that's all. Always a muddle, said Rachel, with another gentle touch upon his arm, as if to recall him out of the thoughtfulness in which he was biting the long ends of his loose neckerchief as he walked along. The touch had its instantaneous effect. He let them fall, turning a smiling face upon her, and said, as he broke into a good-humoured laugh, Ay, Rachel, lass, all is a muddle. That's where I stick. I come to muddle many times, and again I never get beyond it. They had walked some distance, and were near their own homes. The woman's was the first reached. It was in one of the many small streets for which the favourite undertaker, who turned a handsome sum out of the one poor ghastly pomp of the neighbourhood, kept a black ladder, in order that those who had done their daily groping up and down the narrow stairs might slide out of this working world by the windows. She stopped at the corner, and putting her hand in his, wished him good night. Good night, dear lass. Good night. She went, with her neat figure and her sober womanly step, down the dark street, and he stood looking after her until she turned into one of the small houses, there was not a flutter of her coarse shawl, perhaps, but had its interest in this man's eyes. Not a tone of her voice, but had its echo in his innermost heart. When she was lost to his view, he pursued his homeward way, glancing up sometimes at the sky, where the clouds were sailing fast and wildly. But they were broken now, and the rain had ceased, and the moon shone. Looking down the high chimneys of Coketown on the deep furnaces below, and casting titanic shadows of the steam engines at rest upon the walls where they were lodged, the man seemed to have brightened with the night as he went on. His home, in such another street as the first, saying that it was narrower, was over a little shop. 
how it came to pass that any people found it worth their while to sell or buy the wretched little toys mixed up in his window with cheap newspapers and pork there was a leg to be raffled for to-morrow night matters not here he took his end of candle from a shelf lighted it at another end of candle on the counter without disturbing the mistress of the shop who was asleep in her little room and went upstairs into his lodging it was a room not unacquainted with the black ladder under various tenants but as neat at present as such a room could be a few books and writings were on an old bureau in a corner the furniture was decent and sufficient and though the atmosphere was tainted the room was clean going to the hearth to set the candle down upon a round three-legged table standing there he stumbled against something as he recoiled looking down at it it raised itself up into the form of a woman in a sitting attitude heaven's mercy woman he cried falling further off from the figure has thou come back again such a woman a disabled drunken creature barely able to preserve her sitting posture by steadying herself with one begrimed hand on the floor while the other was so purposeless in trying to push away her tangled hair from her face that it only blinded her the more with the dirt upon it a creature so foul to look at in her tatters stains and splashes but so much fouler than that in her moral infamy that it was a shameful thing even to see her after an impatient oath or two and some stupid clawing of herself with the hand not necessary to her support she got her hair away from her eyes sufficiently to obtain a sight of him then she sat swaying her body to and fro and making gestures with her unnerved arm which seemed intended as the accompaniment to a fit of laughter though her face was stolid and drowsy I some hoarse sounds meant for this came mockingly out of her at last and her head dropped forward on her breast Back again she screeched after some minutes as if he had that moment said it yes i'm back again back again ever and ever so often back yes back why not roused by the unmeaning violence with which she cried it out she scrambled up and stood supporting herself with her shoulders against the wall dangling in one hand by the string a dunghill fragment of a bonnet and trying to look scornfully at him i'll sell thee off again and i'll sell thee off again and i'll sell thee off a score of times she cried with something between a furious menace and an effort at a defiant dance come away from the bed he was sitting on the side of it with his face hidden in his hands come away from t tis mine and i've a right to it as she staggered to it he avoided her with a shudder and passed his face still hidden to the opposite end of the room she threw herself upon the bed heavily and soon was snoring hard he sunk into a chair and moved but once all that night it was to throw a covering over her as if his hands were not enough to hide her even in the dark End of chapter ten